Greetings everyone, and welcome to the LEGO Rewind 2022 Year in Review Special. LEGO's 90th anniversary had some interesting shifts, even aside from the actual anniversary stuff. Like you know that double pin system that appears in lines like Life on Mars actually originated in Blacktron, so I should have been crediting that all these years, and even recent themes like Monkey Kid or last year's Small and Ninjago Dragons? It seems we're now transitioning to a clip and bar system that started popping up everywhere, even coincidentally, in a new Black set. I like these, though sometimes the connection is so strong, other pieces may break off first. You can loosen the grip with fewer clips, so it's versatile enough. I think Cities made the best use of this trick going into 2023. Fantastic customization potential. Vikings came back? Sorta. It's a 3-in-1 creator set, the main build clearly referencing the old Viking ship and Midgard Serpent, a secondary Fenris wolf reimagining, and a tertiary cabin with a little red wyvern. If LEGO won't fully revive themes like that, throwing together a mini-wave under one set number is a pretty good alternative, and I hope they keep designing creator sets this way. This creator tiger... is very clever. Mythica was a thing, if you went to Legoland. I got this on eBay. It's just one set, not a theme, but I wish it was. I'd love to see some of the ride's other fantasy creatures built like this. That two-headed serpent, the volcanic crabs, the chimera, there's enough here for a whole wave. If not a couple other sets with this much variety packed in, it'd be a shame to see most of this property wasted, so here's hoping they do something else with it. Monkey Kids have really been going places. Recent waves have introduced all sorts of characters from the lore, including Chang'e, Erlang Shen, and the Shah, finally. And don't even get me started on the latest wave. It feels like the first couple years walked so that 2022 could run. Not just having the confidence to explore more of the theme's roots, but also massively expanding the street building system explored little in 2020 and seemingly abandoned in 2021. Some people seem to think Monkey Kid's on its last legs, but it's already crossed the two and a half year filter that kills most other themes. That's like the Fermi paradox of Lego. I don't think MK's leaving this world anytime soon. Ninjago ended. Okay, not really. Just a series as we've known it for over a decade, and it has been surreal watching the final season start out strong, lose its way, and break the fanbase. I haven't seen LEGO fans cope this hard since the first time Ninjago ended. And Bionicle. It's not even getting a break this time. I have a lot to say, really, but I'm not sure I feel right spilling it all here. Part of the reason I haven't made a proper hidden side episode, even though it retired years ago, is because I already talked about it like three other times, so I'm worried I'll just repeat myself, though I might give it a shot this year. We'll see what my mood is around Halloween. So at least for now, I feel like saving most of my thoughts on this truly eclectic era of Ninjago for another Ninjago episode. Part 2, you could say. If anyone wants to see that... soonish, my Patreon's right there. But I will touch upon other elements of Ninjago. The Legacy line has been replaced by Core, which removes the ninja from their own story and dumps them in a sandbox, where you can tell whatever story you want. You know, like old Lego. The smaller sets are also simpler, like back in the 90s. It's a return to form for Lego, stripping the most popular theme down to its most basic elements of play. It's also yielded a new take on construction, SCCBS, the System Character and Creature Building System. Just a couple new modes, really, but that's the beauty of it, giving System some construction-like traits, right down to Bionicle-esque pre-bent fixed limbs. And I think it works. Heck, on the topic of mechs, we've been getting a lot of good anime mecha references. This creator Mazinger homage, this larger Ninjago mech that also feels like a Mazinger homage, and another Ninjago mech that doubles as a Garen Lagan homage and Gao Gaigar. I'm surprised by how many people didn't see that one. Heck, a few mad lads have gone all the way and made their own Gao Gaigar mocks using only this set's pieces. That's incredible. And this year's off to a good start with an Ava unit. In other giant robot news, LEGO released Optimus Prime. That's a big deal. Hasbro is very protective of, well, maybe not the Transformers brand, given the many times they've let LEGO's competitors take a stab at it, but they are very protective of the play pattern. It's one reason most of those other Primes don't transform. Plus, it's easier and maybe more appropriate to take the truck apart and build the robot. So to see such a big, clean interpretation that transforms so smoothly. As a LEGO fan and a big Transformers fan, I consider this a historic moment. I appreciate the little touches, like the grill and stomach panels tapering into these gaps to give the body some definition the original Prime didn't have. There is one bit you're supposed to parts form between these two crotch panels, so I guess it isn't a perfect transformation. I just leave this one on.
Those who followed long enough may remember that I'm also a Sonic the Hedgehog enjoyer. Between Sonic Frontiers, the second movie, Sonic Prime, other fast platformers like Freedom Planet 2 and Spark 3, and this set, 2022 was the best year to be a Sonic fan in over a decade. This design by Sam Johnson was inspired by this LEGO idea submission by Viv Grinnell, aka Toaster Girl. The build itself is sharp, literally. Stacking all those one by ones erased my fingerprints, but it's way past cool, especially with the sorts of brick built bandits I've wanted to see more of since LEGO Dimensions. But what really got me were these unofficial all builds designed by Viv herself. So I bought two to make this, with only slight mods like sharper spikes and a more detailed rock, and Viv's superior mustache design. It's something how much extra life is added by a couple more badniks, some indentations in the terrain, and space for a few alternate monitors. I've seen amazing mocks of other zones, but I don't think a whole line like this creeping along the walls of your house would be sustainable. If there are more Sonic sets, I imagine they'll be gamier like Mario. But this? You go, Toaster Girl. It's funny that for a while, I thought this Lightyear set was the closest we'd get to seeing classic space in 2022. You'll see why. It got me thinking back to Toy Story, and how visibly LEGO's minifigure design approach has changed over the years. Toy Story 4 made Woody and Buzz look like cosplayers with normal, boring, printed faces. But the older Toy Story sets covering the first three movies had all sorts of wacky head molds, and extended arms and legs that gave Woody and Jesse lanky ragdoll proportions. Then those molds were retired, and people spent a decade begging LEGO to bring them back. I didn't think they ever would. And then Avatar happened. Okay, until they make more Transformers, this is my favorite license theme. I'll cover both waves since we likely won't see any more until the next movie comes along almost two years from now. These animals are exactly how I want LEGO's dinosaurs designed. Brick-built bodies, detailed muscles, decent articulation, and molded heads. They got so many details right, even the chest nostrils. Really appeals to the speculative biology nut in me. The terrain builds are all very different, adding up quickly to make a dense display. The first movie's terrain changed together with bars and clips, not unlike Ninjago's Master of the Mountain sets, and you can arrange them in whatever order you want. The latest wave's ocean builds ditch the clips, but are still made to be arranged, mostly sticking to octagonal shapes that can be clumped together from almost any side. The RDA builds are mostly good. I did mod Korage's amp suit, but I can't take credit for that one. It's mostly Hachiroku 24's design. I just changed some surface details in the barrel of the gun to be even more movie accurate. And yes, I like the Navi tall figs. Though if I had a nickel for every time I've covered indigenous caricatures on this show, with realistic eyes and noses no less, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it's happened twice. Also the Maori appropriation. Also weird that this boy has dreadlocks, though I wouldn't say that's Lego's fault. More likely the guy who implied Native Americans should have fought harder. Ugh. I know some people find the shape of these figures weird, but maybe minus a mold and nose, I really do believe this is the best way LEGO could have done it. The designers tried a few other things, including normal minifig Navi with kid-sized humans and even nanofig humans, and none of them looked right. So what were they supposed to do? They can't be the same size. As is, the scale isn't perfect, but it's close enough. I also appreciate that Navi children are the same height as adult human minifigs, while human children like Spider and even younger Navi are shorter still. Lego made a point not to focus on the military much or give the characters guns, but this Star Wars rifle is perfectly sized for Navi. On human figures, it has a sling over the arm to stay in hand, but this works great. I also used fairy wings to represent the gill mantles that let Navi breathe underwater, though not all the hair pieces have clearance for it. And these flowers make good wood sprites. If LEGO does get around to an Avatar 3 wave, I hope they go back and release a few more things from the first two movies. A hammerhead with a little lemur thrown in, or Korich's Banshee, or the underwater tree. Maybe give Sute the right hairpiece this time? What excites me most about the return of Tall Figs is the precedent they set. These aren't the woody legs anymore. They could be used for any tall character now. Sauron, Chewbacca, Mr. Fantastic, a Chima Giraffe, a Ninjago villain? There's no putting that back in the bottle. Unless they retire the parts again. It's just weird to me that people say this theme is too expensive when it's no more expensive than any other LEGO theme in 2022. Everything shot up this year, even previously wallet-friendly themes like Ninjago, and already overpriced stuff like City just feels like a bad joke. Yet people single out this theme, with all its special molds and prints and tall figs, as particularly problematic. Like it should be cheaper than everything else because they didn't like the movies. 
Not long ago, Monkey Kid was the theme people decried for being too expensive. Now those prices are normal. I don't expect to see another price hike like this for a while, but we'll see. It seems like some sets are getting bigger all the time. Mark my words, someday, maybe in the next few years, we will see an 18 plus $1,000 Lego set with 9,000 pieces. Oh boy. Okay, 90th anniversary stuff. Pirates of Barracuda Bay got me wondering what 2022 might bring, and it didn't disappoint. Castle came back, Space came back, Bionicle came back, sorta. Castle returned with a huge build packed with loving details and loads of characters. The Galaxy Explorer was refitted with all the flourish and sturdiness you'd expect almost 45 years after the original. And it's more of a Creator 3-in-1 than a standard set, with online instructions for two alt builds also recreating specific ships from the time. Now, just like in 1979, you can have a classic space fleet. But that brings us to the gifts with purchase. Along with the Lion Knight's castle, LEGO released a Forest Men hideout, recreating its old counterpart as faithfully and sensibly as the Galaxy Explorer and its little brothers. And they gave people a week to save $150 for it. Not the set itself, the set is free, after buying a bunch of other stuff. I don't care for this business practice. If there was an option to buy the hideout for what it's actually worth, but the GWP still kicked in for people who did spend enough, that'd be perfect. They'd accommodate those who were already going to buy all that Lego, and those who couldn't. Still, this set sold really well. Partly I'd assume to Castle fans buying that, since they clearly go together. It performed so well that LEGO's really leaning into the GWPs now. A recent 2023 example is the Blacktron Cruiser, a remade invader. And the ship is flawless right up there with the Galaxy Explorer, and costs 190 US dollars. Which hurts, but is understandable. The bigger these GWPs are, the more oxygen they steal from the sets you're buying. Then there's this one. Well, first things first. 2022 saw Bionicle join the 90 Years of Play set, and I like this thing. I'm not as crazy about it as some, but all the fan art and mocks it's inspired are a treat the Bionicle community needed. These bite-sized desk toy homages may be a little silly, but treating Taihu the same as the Galaxy Explorer and the Yellow Castle is a compliment. And this 2023 Tahu and Takua GWP? It's beautiful. The box art, the lava board stand that lets you capture classic poses, the designs of Tahu and Takua themselves, the sand pit with Matanui and Makuta stones, it's a little of everything that made the legend great. But you wouldn't know it hearing some people, not just because it's made of bricks, but because they'd have to buy other bricks to get it. And some Bionicle fans don't like bricks. We were talked down to a lot growing up, adult collectors telling us that Bionicle wasn't real Lego because it wasn't bricks. Now we're adults, insisting that bricks aren't real Bionicle. <laughs> we haven't learned a thing. It's so strange to me because I grew up with both. I understand wanting those 2001 Bionicle pieces, that texture, the pop of the ball joints. But you've got to understand, those parts aren't coming back. I was going to save this bit for the 2023 special. But I'm not waiting a year for this. See, it's more expensive for LEGO to keep old molds around that they aren't using than it is to scrap them. Probably for storage reasons or patents. And those 2001 Bionicle molds haven't been used in a long time. Those machines were buried or cut up or melted down before some of you were alive. Even assuming the models are backed up on a computer, standards for tolerances and clutch power change over time, in ways so subtle that we rarely notice. But every time they bring back an old mold, like the woody arms or legs, they essentially create a new piece by modifying it. Even lacquering something means it has to be shrunk down slightly so the paint isn't stripped off by other pieces, making it technically another mold. Re-releasing 2001 Tahu as he was, minus some new measurements, which the designers did consider, we're looking at about 10 pieces, each of which would take many thousands of dollars. And yeah, I know, it's a billion dollar company. They should eat the cost. But can you? The more they reuse a piece, say, for minifigures spread over a wave or two, the more the cost is spread out. Reviving Tahu the way some people want, you'd have to pay like 40 bucks for him. Even if they re-release the other five Toa, that's another 10 new molds between them, and they'd still be expensive. This is why those Marvel action figures, Iron Man, Spider-Man, Venom, they all share the same head mold. It's why smaller SCCBS mechs only get a few new pieces that end up also being used in a bunch of other things. Lego's all about the brick these days. I don't like it, but I've made peace with it. 
They might make specialized head parts for animals and dinosaurs, but it just isn't their way to make so many for a pretty small set. They could do it back then because they were dying. Bionicle was a Hail Mary that amazingly paid off, but it would be impractical these days. Also, new molds aren't even allowed in GWPs. Most don't even have new prints, and this got two. The designers did attempt a bigger brick-built Takanuva GWP, but of course that would have driven up the price. We're lucky they kept the paywall down to only $100. Strangely, you couldn't pick from nearly as many themes as the other GWPs, not even Technic. It's mostly action ones with giant robots like Ninjago or Monkey Kid, probably because they figured those are the sorts of things we'd like. And yeah, those do feel like other ways Bionicle may be built today, if not like this. I do wish this was a normal release, at least a LEGO exclusive and not a GWP, something equal to the Lion Knight's Castle or the Galaxy Explorer or Barracuda Bay to sit proudly on the same shelf as those. But you know what? This'll do. This is a labor of love. The upper management of LEGO may see Bionicle as something best left behind, but the people actually making these toys, sneaking all those Bionicle references into other things, they're Bionicle fans too. And for that, I'm happy they gave us this. I'm happy with this thing like you wouldn't believe, and I want to focus on that. On the simple but charming facsimile of a face with the right brainstock colors for each character. The stand looking kinda like a Suva, Tahu's waist pistons, the slopes on the middle anti-studs on the back of each leg, the very same ball piece on Tahu's chest that he had back then. But my favorite detail? They don't tell you to do this, but if you pull Takua's arms out just a little bit, you can give him the Matanui online game slouch. That is the best kind of dumb, and you couldn't do it with bricks in 2001. You couldn't do anything approaching this with just bricks. I've said many times before that doing this show has shown me how much LEGO's evolved, but handling this made me realize that on a deeper level than ever before. I couldn't have imagined anything like this when I uploaded the Bionicle episode in 2019, when I ended LEGO Rewind's original run. Now, I want to enjoy this, appreciate all the care put into it, what an apt encapsulation it is of what I loved about Bionicle. In time, I'll part together some of the alternate Rahi builds in different colors, and once people start putting out custom printed masks or stickers, oh, we're gonna see so many completed mocks in this style. Heck, someone already whipped up an Exotoa suit out of the Ghost Rider mech bike. That was fast. This set is a gift. Not just for what it is, not just for the feeling of opening and building a new Bionicle in 2023, but the doors it opens. Another new way to build these characters. Similarly, I hope the Blacktron Cruiser inspires people to update other Blacktron designs in that style. Maybe the Alienator. Well, that was my take on 2022, and a little of 2023. Who knows how the rest of it's gonna go. But this, right now, this is a special moment. When I created the Mega Rewind timeline for April Fools a few years ago, I labeled it episode 49 because I didn't intend for LEGO Rewind to make it that far. And the joke was the absurdity of ever finding enough material to squeeze out of Mega Blocks. Any higher just seemed over the top to me. But then LEGO Rewind kept going, and here we are. While I stopped numbering episodes after Bionicle, this is the 49th episode. So until further notice, we have surpassed the Mega Rewind timeline, making this the superior one. This also makes the next episode yet another milestone, the 50th LEGO Rewind. I imagine it'll take a couple decades of new themes coming and going, years in review, and patron fund adventures to reach 100 episodes. Honestly, the thought of going that far scares me, and we already peaked with Bionicle, so what else is there? What could be appropriate for such an occasion? Yeah, we're doing a classic space episode. About time, huh? I was gonna talk more about the Galaxy Explorer and space in general in this episode, but I wound up having so much to say, I decided to make a whole video out of it. That's it for today. To support my work, check out my books on Amazon and itch.io. I'm also getting ready to release my next book. It's the longest one yet. It'll probably be out by the next episode. Thank you to all my patrons for making 2022 what it was, especially the idiot and maniac for bricks. See you next time. Toodles!